people in the crowd here were like alive and cognizant in the 60s, like kind of remember them. Yeah. A good portion. How many of us have not, how many of us were not, were not alive? It's, it's like 4, 60%, 40%. Not bad, not bad. So let's bring our first speaker up here. As I said, we, she is a, a professor at the College of the Holy Cross, a history expert, and in particular on social movements, uh, which I think is kind of a cool thing to, uh, to be an expert on. And one of those social movements, one of the many that were important in the 1960s was the women's movement. We're going to get a little insight into that right now. So please welcome to the stage. Let's put your hands together really loud. <laughs> Applause. Let's hear it for Stephanie Yu. Thank you, Edgar, for that rousing introduction. I just want to start today by asking one question. How many of you here have ever worn a bra? How many of you, my husband just raised his hand. Interesting what, <laughs> you can learn some interesting things at Boston Talks after 30 years together. How many of you have ever thought about burning that bra? Hmm, couple. All right, so what I want to talk about tonight is um, one of the things I work on is social movements, but I also work on memory and narrative and why we believe we know what we think we know about the past, which is not always accurate. And so I want to start with a bra story, and I want to talk a little bit about burning of bras. Uh, one of the things that we were told is to kind of make this personal, so I will tell you my personal story of when I wished I could have burned a bra. I'm 12 years old. Come with me to the May Company in West Los Angeles with my mother, who is going to buy her pubescent daughter a bra. Now, my mother was the mother of eight children. I am her last and her sixth daughter. She has been there before. So there is no fitting room in my future. There is the hall, the aisle, with all the women there, and my mother stretching the bra across my chest. Mortification, right? Had there been a torch, kerosene, a lighter, that shit would have been burned. But Excuse me, is that okay? But it wasn't burned. And nor were any bras burned during American feminist protests in the 1960s. And yet we have this idea, bra burners, oh, the bra burners, right? So what I thought I'd talk about a little bit tonight is that idea. Why do we hold on to this idea of the bra burners? Where does it come from? And why is it important to push back against that idea for various reasons? So if this were Jeopardy, this would be favorite, one of my favorite moments in 1960s history for double Jeopardy, and that would be the 1968 No More Miss America protest in Atlantic City. So in 1968, a group of women the New York radical women who were radical women from New York organized a protest. About 100 women went to down to New York to, to Atlantic City to protest the Miss America pageant. Um, it was part of a tradition of guerrilla theater at the time. Some of you from the era may remember some of those examples. Um, I'll talk about that in a second, but I do want to talk about that this was more than just about shock theater and getting people to see the patriarchy. There was a very serious critique of American culture and women's voice and place and bodies in that. So the New York Radical Women, as part of their protest, a group went into the Atlantic City Convention Center, unfurled a banner that said women's liberation and yelled, no more Miss America. They were quickly escorted out. There was also a protest on the boardwalk. And part of that protest, which I'll talk about in a second, was a series of 10 very well thought out critiques of why Miss America represented everything that was bad for this country and why women in particular and allies of feminists needed to rise up. So this is where I want to consult my notes for a second because I want to make sure I give them their, their due. They had a 10 point program or critique. That should sound familiar to some of you who, are, who know something about the period. You might remember the 10-point platform of the Black Panthers. These women grew out of a new left critique of, of authority and culture. Um, and these movements, the new left, the civil rights movement, black separatism, women's separatism, all really multiplied on each other, right? They multiplied each other. And a lot of the women who might have participated in civil rights then formulated a feminist critique of that so-called liberationist movement that oppressed women. Same thing with the anti-war and the New Left movement, which was quite a macho movement. And a lot of women were like, hey, we're, we're critiquing imperialism and that you guys are being imperialistic about us. Make the coffee, take the notes, right? So the New York radical women came up with a 10-point critique of the Miss America pageant. And they included, and this is why I have to share them with you, because in true radical 60s form, they are fun and funny but they're smart and they're right. Okay, the first one was that Miss America was a degrading, mindless, boob, girly symbol. 
So funny, right? But it's true. It's this idea of saying Miss America reduces women to their bodies. This is like a 4-H competition. You're being judged on all these things. It's not about your mind, and it's really bad, and it's not a form of citizenship. Second critique was that it is, quote, racism with roses. Not since its founding in 1921 had there been a woman of color crowned Miss America, and in fact, simultaneous to this, con this uh, protest, at the Ritz-Carlton Atlantic City, a group of African-American civil rights activists were holding a black Miss America pageant and crowned a black Miss, America, black Miss America. But what's interesting about that, when one of the New York radical women was asked about that, she said, I don't think that's good for black women either. Black women mimicking access to white patriarchal racist structures is bad for all of us, right? So the very smart stuff. Also, that Miss America was a military death mascot. That's a really hardcore critique in 1968 in the middle of the, of the Vietnam War, right? The notion that Miss America is going to go out on tour is going to encourage young men to fight in a war that they deemed was immoral and unethical, okay? So very smart, very smart folks. Um, I won't go into any more of the details because of time, but I do want to turn to what I think is one of the best parts of this story, and that is the guerrilla action that took place on the boardwalk. What they did, these women, is they had a big trash can and they encouraged women from all over to bring instruments of female torture, as they called them, to the trash can so that they could burn them. So if I were to ask you, what might some instruments of female torture be then and today? What might you bring to the trash can? Girdle, high heels for sure, right? What? Thongs. Razors, do you see? Ladies, it's resonating. It's real, right? Absolutely, plus throw in a, maybe a Playboy, maybe a Cosmo that's teaching you all about how to please men in bed, like God forbid you have needs. Um, ladies Home Journal, false eyelashes. These are these symbols, girdle, of everything that's wrong for them about the patriarchy. Now, the New York radical women did want to burn those items, but the cops in Atlantic City said you can't do it. So all they did was put it in the trash can. However, fake news is not new. A reporter for the New York Post, in writing up the story, called the, called the story, put the headline, Bra Burners and Miss America. And that's where the phrase bra, bra burners originated. Now, to her credit, she did it satirically. And Kevin maybe can talk about a little bit about Americans and their inability to understand satire. She did it, <laughs> she did it satirically. I don't know if any of you read, he's talking about a piece on uh, gun control, which we can talk about another time. But they don't understand satire. And she was trying to point out that these are angry, smart women, but they also have a sense of humor, so they're not dismissible just because they're speaking, right? This kind of guerrilla theater has a long tradition, right? And even a short tradition for these women. Just a few we weeks earlier in Chicago, the members of the Youth International Party, the Yippies, of which Abby Hoffman was a co-founder. Abby Hoffman, who was from, born in, thank you, Worcester, Mass, where I live, um, they put a pig up for president, named Pigasus the Immortal, as a, as a protest against what they saw to be the ridiculousness of the Democratic Party in 1968, trying to scramble to make sense of LBJ saying, I will not seek nor accept the nomination of my party. In the wake of the Tet Offensive, a clear unveiling of the absurdity of that war, right? So there's guerrilla theater there. There's also other things that were burned in this period. We know about riots in inner cities that were burned. But nearby here, at the Arlington Street Unitarian Universalist Church, I don't know if any of you are congregants there, in 1967, October, a major action for the New England Draft Resistance Group was the tune in, turn in, burn in ceremony, in which over 100 young men turned in their draft cards, and over 60 of those cards were burned. One of which was burned not by a young man, but by a friend of a young man, a woman named Nan Stone, who was a theology student and Methodist minister at BU at the time. So draft cards were burned, and they were burned in a statement of patriotism, right? Those draft card burners and resistors have subsequently been labeled dodgers, running away people from responsibility. These were young people who said, I am consciously breaking the law, and I will accept the consequences of that because I deem this an, an illegal war. So I think I'm being the best patriot, right? I would argue similarly, that the New York radical women in protesting the Miss America pageant, I don't think they were very interested in claiming patriotism. I think they thought the whole thing was a scam and a sham, but were nonetheless enacting 
democracy and citizenship in really vital ways. So why does this matter? I'm gonna end with another little story. I'm in college. I went to Georgetown University. Senior year, junior year, I'm the only female editor at the newspaper and I'm thinking, I've got all these super smart women friends. This is 1987. Why am I the only female editor on this board? This is nuts. So some friends of mine and I get together and we co-found a feminist journal called The New Press. We thought we were very radical. There is a early in the year, senior year, kind of one of those go on to the main quad and everybody has a table for all the intramural and co-curricular activities. I walk up, I know we have a table, I ask a friend of mine, seemingly progressive guy, who would call himself progressive, hey, where's the table for the new press? And he said, oh, the bra burner mag? And I thought, really? Interesting, right? Why does this continue to matter? So I'm an historian, I teach young people, I take it really seriously. I teach at a liberal arts college, I take it really seriously. I teach at a Jesuit school that has a mission around social justice and the preference for the marginalized. And when I hear my students say things like, well, I'm not a feminist, but, I joke and I say, look, the F word is not the F bomb. The F word these days is feminist. And I think in part it's because of the kind of deleterious work that ideas around bra burning to be able to label an entire group who are serious political people with serious political ideas, presenting those serious political ideas in creative ways, it's a way to dismiss wholesale ideas that don't support, I would argue, hegemony, patriarchy, and the like, right? So my husband was just reminding me, um, he was listening on the way in to uh, a story about the young people who are organizing in Florida and around the country about violence, the culture of violence in America, and the ways in which some people are doing a similar move to dismiss very serious people who with their bodies and their voices are standing up for principles as you're just a bunch of stupid kids. And to me, that's no different than you're just a bunch of women, put on your makeup, which by the way, I did put lipstick on for tonight, so hypocrisy is real. Um, there's a heel. Um, look, man, we're all part of our culture. But I think it's a really insidious way to silence people. And so I guess I would like to end with a pitch for a book, which is Chimamanda Dichi. Do any of you know her? She's awesome. Look, somebody's very excited in the background. And her, I'm trying to, I want to make sure I have her, it's a tiny little volume and it's totally awesome and I want to make sure I have the title right, but it's basically, I think it is, Why Everyone Should Be Feminist. And I think if we could get our heads around that, de-F word the word feminist, de-bra burn something that never happened, question why we hold on to things to alienate, marginalize, and disfranchise serious political critique, we would be in a much better place and I think it's just as important today as it was in 68. So thank you. Let's hear it for Stephanie Yule. Don't go. I'm not Don't going go. Anywhere. I got a little preachy and political. Did but I do that. You were feeling it though. I always feel it. You were feeling it, so I think it's all right. So, uh, oh man, I, I mean, I kind of wish we had. Tw there's so much to talk about sure. based on what you were just talking about. Um, <laughs> can you put the, put that? You know, you you sort of gave us. You, we sort of jumped into like one particular moment, mm -hmm. right? But that 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 was that was something that happened in the context of a of sort of a larger movement around right. women's issues in the 1960s. Um, Want me to situate that that yes. those kind of voices? Yeah, situate that a little bit in in where that was in terms of you know the overall movement sure. at the time. So I guess I would use Bell Hooks, who's a African American feminist uh, theorist. Who can shout out to Bell? who would actually say there's no the feminist movement. She is this rhetorical yeah. move in her writing where she just calls it feminist movement and you don't realize it and that she's missing a definite article until you realize she's saying nobody has a corner on ideas of what constitutes liberation for people and women. Um, look, the New York radical women are a tiny, tiny, small cell of super leftist radical women. They happen to be super entertaining and, and I think right on the money. However, they are definitely on the margins. Um, there's a much broader, nonetheless still not mainstream, um, feminist work that's going on that would be called second wave liberal reform-minded feminism, and that would grow out of sort of Betty Friedan and the Feminine Mystique, which is published in 63, the founding of the National Organization for Women in 66. The notion that the system itself isn't so broken, it just need, you just need to add women to it, right? This notion of add women and stir, and it'll be fine, and that tends to 
represent a certain social positioning, right? That if I'm an elite white woman and I want to get a Harvard Law degree, I get my Harvard Law degree, liberation! But that's about me and I, not so much a we, and it certainly doesn't pay as much attention, and this is a big criticism of those women at the time, um, to class issues, to sexuality. Betty Friedan notoriously called women the lesbians the lavender menace. Did not want to be associated with lesbianism because that wouldn't be uh, supported by the mainstream men whose interests and support they were seeking. So there's clearly a broad spectrum, and I'm just talking about white women's feminism. Yeah. I did mention bell hooks, but there's all sorts of critiques from all over. Can I say one other thing? Yeah. One of my favorite documents from the period is from 71, and it's written by a woman named Enriqueta Vasquez, and it's called Soy Chicana Primero, and she's part of the Chicano movement out in LA, and she tears the Chicano men and says, look, you want me to be the Our Lady of Guadalupe and have your babies because that feeds your sense of masculinity that you can be macho, and that's not good for me. That's actually an inheritance of colonialism. And then my white sisters, you want me to deny my ethnicity, deny my Mexicanness, and that's not good for me. My language doesn't hyphenate me. It doesn't make me choose, am I a Mexican-American woman or a female Mexican-American? I can be Chicana, which is both and at the same time, and that's the walk I want to walk. I love that, you know, because there's that notion of an integrated sensibility. But movements often want people to choose where your loyalties lie. So Why? Why do you think that is? Oh, I think it's about power. It's always about power. I mean, I think that, you know, unfortunately, your view of the world often makes the most sense to you, and it's really difficult to understand when a person might agree, both agree and disagree with you at the same time, right? And when you feel something physically, viscerally, personally, and you believe that to be the answer, your, your way is the way, um, it's very hard to build coalitions. Because no matter how, it's like the guys in um, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was an uh, integrated African-American civil rights organization. They didn't want to hear when the women were saying, why am I taking notes at the meetings? Why am I cooking at the Freedom House and cleaning the Freedom House? And you guys are doing the important work of revolution when we're claiming that we're all in this together. And the guys don't want to hear that. They're like, because it's working for them. The white women don't want to hear it. It's working for them. So we're human and flawed. So, um, you know, it's interesting because you talk about the fact that, like, one of the things that you're sort of expert in is, like, why do we remember things the way we remember them and all of that, right? And certainly one of the ways that people tend to frame the 60s mm -hmm. is, you know, a series of movements. There were all right. these, mo there were all these social movements in the 60s, right? And sure, you know, I, you know, I'm sure that's a far more complicated story, but we're, we're, we're in a time period now, maybe not that there haven't been movements in between, but there seems to be a sort of rise of movements again now, yeah. including, including around women's issues like the Me Too movement, mm -hmm. which is happening now. As somebody with sort of the perspective that you have on past movements or how we remember them or what they mean, when you look at the sort of movements that are happening now or the social climate right now, What's your advice for us who are following oh, these? Geez. Like we, you know, like how should we be? Like I got how no do you answers. participate in yeah. these? How do you how do you not make it worse, or how do we not repeat the same mistakes? Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't have advice for you except I guess I would have a corrective, yeah. which would say, look, we like to look back on the '60s and see it a certain way. The vast majority of Americans in the 1960s did not participate in movements. The vast majority of people in the 1960s would have thought that the radical New York women and those draft card burners were bad Americans. So it's really important that a small group not be allowed to, to speak for the whole, right? It might be sexier and more interesting and fun, and, but, it, but this sort of problem of an American democratic republic with a fundamentally passive citizenry is something that is part of the... So of our history. So while the Me Too movement, I mean, the Women's March in Boston, I mean, all this great stuff, the kids down in, in Florida, um, I think those are wonderful, but I, again, I think for the most part people, and this isn't just an American thing, but we like to talk about democracy, but you know, when you have to actually enact it, there are potential costs. And people like to be comfortable. So I do think it's exciting. I would say that the current administration has galvanized people's sense of possibility and hope. Ironically, because the previous administration used the word hope, but didn't, that didn't happen as much. This administration seems to be, for certain Americans, a place of galvanization, but so too is it on the other side. 
So I think we're just in a, in a moment of, um, of, of, we're not repeating history, but I think there is an opportunity, I guess, to enact your core values. And I think it's super important, particularly around, I will say this as, a, as an academic, around issues of what is, what is factual. This, I think, is potentially the most deleterious thing to a citizenry, is the idea of, under, I'm getting really serious, of undercutting, I mean, if you get like a tyranny handbook, undercutting the, um, the media and freedom of the press, right? Questioning what is truth, claiming to replace information with fabricated truth, I think that's the thing we need to do the most work on, which then is about education and creating critical people, maybe even more than people in the streets. All right, really quick before I let you go, we were talking about an you were talking about an exhibition that uh, that oh, yeah. you're involved in. Tell us real quick about that. Oh sure. That. So uh, speaking of how we remember what we remember and what stories get told in the past couple decades, there've been great work on LGBTQ history and history from the margins, but even those histories tend to be told from major metropolitan areas. And so I just wanted to put a shout out to any of you from Central Mass or with people in Central Mass that I'm co-curating an exhibit in Worcester on LGBTQ history in Worcester because those smaller areas, those rural communities have a really different story and those stories haven't been told and we're doing that for the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising which is next summer 1969. So if anybody has anybody they know or that I should talk to because we're building it from the ground up, let me know. Stephanie Yule everybody, let's hear it for her. All right, our next speaker is going to come up for a little conversation with me right now. Uh, is, I'm trying to think of the right word. Is it scenester? Somebody who was on the scene in the 60s, music expert, media expert, a uh, guy who's been there, done that. A uh, remarkable career, uh, a, a, a music and media guy, and those were both really important parts of the 1960s. So let's welcome up to the stage Mr. David Bieber. Everybody, and uh, I guess the statement would be, uh, if you can remember the 60s, you probably weren't there. And whoever said that probably doesn't remember that he said that because he was there. But be that as it may. My mind is already blown. <laughs> All right. Yeah, man. Yeah. There you go. So, uh, David, there, there's so many things we could talk about. We were, we were talking in the green room before we came out about some stuff that I'm going to want to get into that really wasn't in the plan. But I want to start with some music stuff because, uh, you know, popular music certainly was a huge part of the 60s. It's a big thing that I'm into. We've got a great soundtrack happening here tonight. I mean, it's such a big sort of thing. And I know that a lot of folks, I think, know on the national scene, what was going on music-wise and stuff like that. But I want you to take us inside of the Boston music scene a little bit in the 1960s and where we sort of fit into the picture and what was happening here that was in line with other things that were happening or maybe even out of step with it. Well, I was, I was actually still uh, growing up in Ohio, so I missed a lot of Boston during the 60s. But the funny thing about uh, the references to Boston would be uh, a song by the Standells, Dirty Water, which in fact, those guys weren't from Boston. And, uh, <laughs> but Boston had a very kind of negative image as the uh, later 60s came along. There was a kind of uh, MGM Records force feeding of a Boston sound, which really didn't exist. It was meant to be a kind of, uh, East Coast version of the West Coast San Francisco sound, which was totally legitimate and quite successful artistically as well as commercially. But uh, this was the brainchild of a guy named Alan Lorber at MGM Records to kind of lump all the Boston bands together to create one overarching theme. And in fact, they were very disparate performers. They all had their own individual sounds. And so I think it took actually into the 1970s when you had bands like the Jay Giles Band and uh, Aerosmith and later Boston and the Cars and certainly Jonathan Richmond and Modern Lovers to create a kind of validity to uh, what was the very much uh, 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 just very, very illegitimate Boston sound. As a matter of fact, there was an East Coast counterpart magazine called Fusion 
and uh, counterpart to Rolling Stone magazine, and they showed the Boston Sound. Uh, it, it was the cover story, and it showed just a big deflated balloon with, <laughs> with the words Boston Sound. And um, wow. How about how about where it how, how about where it fits in in terms of the national scene at the time? You know, I th I think about you read stories. Um, you know, obviously prior to the '60s, but like when theater was huge. You know, Boston was a big thing because people would preview here before they went down to New York and stuff like that. Right? right. There's a general proximity to New York. Um, New York, obviously, in the 1960s, important music place. Uh, nationally, internationally, music happening here, like. You know, when the Beatles come to America and go on tour, they obviously come to Boston. Wh where do we sort of fit in? Are there sort of bigger, sort of more national acts that sort of fit into the Boston story a little bit in ways maybe we don't know about or don't think about? Well, the acts did actually come through. I mean, you had the Beatles certainly playing uh, at the Boston Garden. You actually had, uh, and they played Suffolk Downs. You had the Rolling Stones play the Manning Bowl in Lynn, which is uh, kind of a strange venue. But, uh, I think one of the greatest contributions that Boston made, particularly the mid to later 60s, uh, and this was maybe an outgrowth of the folk scene that really did have considerable traction in Boston, late 50s, early 60s, Club 47, uh, kind of in that same vicinity as Passim's. You, had you, you can applaud for Club 47, <laughs> Passim, yeah. But, Dylan, you know, Baez, all of them, yeah, right? Joan Baez, like, yeah. Bob Dylan, Dave Van Ronk, uh, the Queskin Jug Band, uh, Jeff and Maria Muldar, uh They're just so many. And, and I think what happened, too, is that there was a very supportive media for a lot of the things that were emerging out of Boston. You know, in 1966, uh, the Boston After Dark was created. Uh, so what was that? What was Boston After Dark? Well, it was basically uh, a, a four-page pamphlet, in a way, that gave uh, limited political viewpoints, but was kind of a clearinghouse for entertainment that was happening in Boston. The coffee houses, the clubs, uh, the venues that people could see. Uh, you have to understand, this was clearly a pre-internet era, and it was people found information from flyers and posters on telephone poles, and the brilliant idea came up, well, let's start a publication supported by advertising that is uh, parallel to the kind of entertainment information that we'll be providing. There were also other publications that were a little more politically active, uh, broadside, uh, uh, at later Avatar, um, and there was the Cambridge Phoenix, but there were so many uh, underground publications, meaning in the sense that they were reactive against the Boston newspapers, the traditional media, and giving the point of view of the youth culture and all that accompanied it. So, you know, is, is that, is it happening? Is that, that sort of, you know, we think today of Boston as, um, you know, a college town. And it was then. There's a lot of universities, right, a lot of right. colleges around here. Obviously, some of the stuff happening on college campuses, very important in the 1960s. Um, you know, that that sort of underground media scene that's going on in Boston, for a city that so this size, was it, was it of outgrowth importance? Was it, you know, was this the intellectual hotbed we think of it was uh, as today? Was there movement on college campuses here? What was that sort of intellectual youth movement, sort of underground media piece. What was it like here in the 1960s? Well, it, it was pretty exciting. I mean, when I came here in 1968 to go to school, uh, it was very palpable, very energized. The peace marches that drew hundreds of thousands of people, you know, the stampedes that went through Harvard Square. I mean, my observation was the only people that really got rich off of the movement were the people who replaced the glass and all the bank buildings that got destroyed in all the marches. You know, there'd be a march through Harvard Square, all the windows would be shattered. The next day, the plywood would be up, and then a week later, there'd be new glass, and then two weeks later, there'd be another march, and the whole thing would repeat itself. Uh, show of hands, anybody break glass in Harvard Square <laughs> in the 1960s? <laughs> Still not admitting it. Yeah. And it's <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the music, uh, both local and national, was certainly uh, given tremendous attention by uh, the existence uh, and the creation of WBCN in 1968, which 
interestingly enough, next month is coming on to its 50th birthday. Had it continued to exist, it went uh, and changed formats to the Sports Hub in uh, 2009. But it had a considerable run from March 15th, 1968 until 2009. And uh, I think that, that so much of what was happening in the music and also in the clubs, uh, clubs at the time including the Boston Tea Party, the Psychedelic Supermarket, the Unicorn, that were giving a kind of uh, uh, one hand washing the other opportunity to the performers who were coming through and there really weren't any road maps. Everyone was kind of making it up as they went along. You know, the, the Boston Tea Party was created in 1967. Uh, Don Law was involved in that. Uh, you know, he goes way back, a pioneer as far as presenting music. He's still active and at it today. But, you know, WBCN as an FM station uh, was playing album cuts, was taking political positions, was having uh, guests on with a particular point of view that was compatible with the music that uh, this really kind of started earlier 60s, but it was not fully embraced by the AM radio stations. You know, they had time constraints, songs were two minutes and 37 seconds, you know, whereas, you know, some of the bands that were creating music would be an entire album side. BCN would play that. BCN would have those kinds of people on the air as they came through town, played the clubs, and got reviewed in the Cambridge Phoenix or in Boston After Dark. So it was, it, was, um, it was a real force that was not waiting for somebody else to give it justification and sanctioning. It was like peer group pressure that we were voting for each other to succeed in taking the microphone and taking the megaphone to be able to champion the things that we liked and embraced. Was it exciting? Oh, tremendously. It really was. And we were making it up as we went along and really just having a great time because in its own way, it was entertainment. And uh, I mean, uh, it's funny, the reference to uh, the Yippie Party uh, nominating a pig uh, for president. There was a sense of humor, the same way that an Abby Hoffman would go to the New York Stock Exchange and throw dollar bills down and watch the stockbrokers scramble to pick up the dollars. <laughs> you know, like, it, there, was, there was a real theater of absurdity because the times in their own way were so dramatic and sometimes horrific that you needed that element of humor, the jocular uh, attitude to just get through the day. I mean, it, even things that looked like they were gonna get traction and succeed, the summer of love, you know, started maybe in April in San Francisco, April of 1967. By the autumn of 1967, the, uh, the natives of San Francisco were, they had a funeral procession with a casket where dangling from the casket was a sign, death of the hippie, because it was over and done so fast. You know, that previous spring, George Harrison of the Beatles had been walking the streets uh, unbothered. With those heart sunglasses on, right? Yeah, He's got yeah, heart-shaped sunglasses you know, love on. Love beats, yeah. and you know, uh, it, was, it was that summer of Sgt. Pepper, and you know, it's strange to think now, just like as BCN would have had a 50th birthday, Sgt. Pepper last summer was the 50th anniversary. And it's kind of curious how some of these landmark creations actually never do go away and they get reevaluated and newly appreciated by subsequent generations as well. You know, before we move off of music, I want you to take me inside some, in particular, w the, the club that I hear the most about is the Boston Tea Party. That's the, that's the one that like people talk to me. A anybody here remember it, been to it? I'm just curious, a couple. What, you know, like, what was it like in there? Like, who did you see play there? Like, you uh, know. I mean, the, the Boston Tea Party was a multiple night engagement. I, uh, I am uh, the curator of the Verb Hotel, which is in the Fenway, and it's pretty much dedicated to Boston uh, acts and Boston media and uh, the full panorama from the 60s up to the present. And there's one particularly telling calendar poster that hangs uh, in the Verb lobby. And it just shows who played there um, in the month of May, 1969. This was right on Lansdowne Street where um, uh, the House of Blues is today. And so in that month of May, you had three nights of, and you have to understand that, that the club capacity was about 1,500 and change. And the audience was no further than where we are um, in terms of interacting with each other. 
three nights of Led Zeppelin, three nights of The Who with uh, uh, Rasan Roland Kirk opening, uh, three nights of Jeff Beck with Rod Stewart, two nights of The Velvet Underground with the Allman Brothers opening, and <laughs> while this was an exceptional, you know, maybe the lowest billed act of all was Poco, you know, and, <laughs> it, but, uh, and, and what has to be remembered too about those times, uh, uh, right. $5 uh, general yeah, admission. I mean, uh, exactly, nice. exactly. Uh, and and you th it, it was, and, and sometimes the nights were, the, the opening night of a three night set were kind of almost throwaways in this, and it was like almost like a dress rehearsal. I remember uh, in uh, 1970 seeing Elton John at the tea party, and he was in for a Thursday, Friday, Saturday night engagement. And the first, granted it was his first American tour, but when I saw him, I, there were fewer people in the room that are in this room right now. You know, it was almost like, okay, you know, here's your introduction to Boston, an introduction to the club, get your sea legs and get comfortable and focus on Friday and Saturday. Good times? Oh, excellent, excellent. <laughs> and just, uh, and, and also just, you, you weren't in a fixed position seat, you know, wasn't, the, you know, Elton John is getting ready to do a three-year farewell tour, and uh, you know that he's going to be playing stadiums, and it's going to be 40, 50, 60,000 people, and it's the big cash grab, the final, you know, uh, last roundup. But, you know, back then, as the person said, you know, $5, sometimes even less, you know, you could say, 350, 450, depending on whether you bought at the at the door or bought it, tickets in advance. And when you talk 350, 450, you have to remind people there's a decimal point in there. You know, because the way <laughs> ticket prices are today, you know, it's 250, 350, 450 dollars. All right. So you're, you know, it's interesting. You're touching on something that that I that I kind of find fascinating, which is let let's take the test case of Elton John, right? handful of people going to see him in his first thing in Boston. They're paying five bucks to go see him at a small club. Now, X number of years later, he's, he's like you said, on a final cash grab. You know, after a glorious career, he's been knighted by the damn Queen of England. Right, right. Um, but, you know, when you talk about being in the moment in the 60s, it's revolutionary, it's heady times, it's making it up as you go along. As you sort of look back on it now, or you know, think back on it now, was it a moment in time? Was it, did it change things? Did, you know, did the times change? Did people change? Did they just grow up? Like, how do you look back on it and say, how much was the needle moved? How much did we change the world? How much did the world change us kind of thing? Well, I, th I think what we started talking about before uh, tonight's activities began, just comparing today and the drama and the chaos uh, and the combative nature of life as we know it, there was an equal amount and maybe even more so in the 60s. It was, uh, it was just, a, you know, we can look back on the 60s and we know how things turned out. We know that, you know, Kennedy was assassinated in 63 and some people see that as the beginning of the 60s. And we know that Four students were killed at Kent State in 1970, and people see that as the end of the 60s. But we, everything is history. We have the rear view mirror perspective. When it comes to today, I think the thing that is so uh, dismaying is we don't know what real world theater we're gonna get tomorrow when we wake up. And that is the unpredictability that has, I think, so much of us unbalanced. In the moment, Again, like I, th I, you know, you're touching on something I think that's really important, which is that, you know, in our present moment, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And there was a time when, in the 1960s, you didn't know what was going to be happening tomorrow. And like you said, there were, the president was assassinated, and other important figures were assassinated later in the decade. Right. And there was a giant war going on in Vietnam that was like dividing the country in two. And there was a sometimes very violent civil rights movement happening, and there was all kinds of chaos. In, in in sort of everywhere you looked, right? Like this is this was all happening in real time. How anxiety-inducing was that? Oh, tremendously. And I think that the fact that there were so many political, sociological, cultural, sexual, dramatic changes 
almost on a month-by-month -month basis that kept going relentlessly throughout the 60s. And I think in the 70s with, you know, kind of disco and cocaine and nightlife and even the punk movement, it was like this gigantic sigh of relief that we don't have to go through those changes as much. We could take a mental vacation. The 70s in their own way with their own form of blight and despair and bu you know busing and culminating yeah, in yeah. soft rock uh, it was yeah exactly <laughs> you, know? you know you know dan you look, fogelberg uh, debbie debbie boone and you know you light up my life and uh, i i i think that the, the the dramatic pace you know and you're right whether it was cities entire communities being burned to the ground whether there were the assassinations starting in you know, uh, with with Kennedy and moving on to M Medgar and, uh, Evers and, and Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy, the, it, it just changed. It was far more than the butterfly effect of something marginally happening in South America. This was very real. And for the people who were the baby boomers, every day was that potential of your life being on the line. As the war increased, as the draft became much more of a factor of people's lives, uh, th th you were, uh, a, you know, you were, you were a candidate. You were a potential uh, piece for the war machine. And I think that there, that affected the music. It created that whole genre of protest music. I mean, there were protests before that. Obviously, Dylan was doing things in the earlier 60s, you know, sometimes, you know, cloaked in a sense of humor. But uh, I think that as the acceleration of the 60s happened, there were far more things to be really concerned about and feeling imperiled by. David, before I let you go, you mentioned uh, the Verve Hotel that you have, and, and you can kind of stroll through memory lane a little bit there. How do, how do I do that? Do I have to stay in the hotel to do no, that? No, absolutely not. You can, uh, that's, you know, I, I spent uh, 16 years as the creative service director at WBCN and 19 years uh, as director of special projects at the Boston Phoenix and WFNX, and uh, I guess I may be a curse because all those institutions are gone now. <laughs> but uh, and this is our last Boston talks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for coming. <laughs> Don't forget to tip your waitress. Uh, but uh, the, the great, the great kind of second act is that uh, I was approached by Steve Samuels, who owns the Verb Hotel, and he wanted to do a celebration of retaining the bones of a 1959 hotel and its architecture and really respect the music that had come out of the Fenway and the clubs on Lansdowne Street and the fact that WBCN was right next door at 1265 Boston and that there were recording studios and rehearsal spaces down the street. And so from my archive, we dressed the Verb Hotel. And I've been doing that for four years and we have new exhibits going up all the time and you don't have to stay overnight you can just park right there tell the valet no charge you're just there to take a look at the lobby and the corridors and it's really meant to be a kind of from 1960s to the present um, display of what emerged out of Boston and you know uh, obviously the big names the Giles band and and, and uh, Aerosmith and so forth, but some of the small bands as well that are just celebrated. Human Sexual Response, for example, uh, Jonathan Richman and the Modern Lovers. And uh, I uh, have recently taken uh, about 10,000 square feet in a warehouse in Norwood uh, to be able to retrieve all the things that I've aggregated over the years, uh, just being fortunate enough to be part of the media. And as a result, I'm trying to put these out in front of the public not so much to have a museum, but I've done exhibits at the uh, Antiquarian Book Fair, uh, the Boston Calling Film Festival, and I think these are great artifacts to be shared with people like you who have a curiosity about the past, and they, in a way, they're the breadcrumbs for the future. David Bieber, everybody, let's hear it for him. Thank you. <laughs>